streamlined super predators of the sea, sharks are the most feared and misunderstood creatures on Earth. A recent surge of vicious attacks on humans has once again propelled this well-armed denizen of the deep into the spotlight. While scientists battle to learn more about the controversial shark, vengeful hunters may well be pushing them to the brink of extinction. simply as Jaws. It has no oceanic rivals as a predator, and at lengths of 20 or more feet, and weights that can top two tons, it is the third largest fish in the ocean. Despite all of its notoriety, little is known about the behavior of the white shark, or why it has attacked more than 100 humans worldwide since 1950, killing 22. More than half of all great white attacks on man have occurred here on California's central coastline. The 120-mile stretch north and south of San Francisco has even been dubbed the white shark attack capital of the world, and also the Red Triangle. As attack statistics continue to rise, the questions regarding shark attack are many, and man, balancing a need for ocean-going recreation and a newfound awareness of protecting the environment and all its creatures, turns to science for answers. At the Bodega Marine Laboratory in Bodega Bay, California, scientists and experts from around the world have gathered together for the first White Shark Symposium in 10 years. Dr. Leonard Campagno, an international shark expert, has traveled from South Africa to attend the symposium. The one thing that I hope that the conference and its proceedings uh, um, eliminates is this uh, Jaws mythos of the white shark as a simple, mindless eating machine. Um, I think we've seen a lot of examples over the past couple of days of different uh, predatory strategies, ways of, of taking prey, different things that the white shark does in different areas, and detailed behavior, that they have complex behavior. Much of the white shark's reputation as a mindless eating machine stems from film footage showing white sharks, highly stimulated by bait and chum, attacking and biting cages for the cameras. Because the white will rarely approach man without the stimuli of blood and fish entrails designed to attract him, observing the white shark in a non-baited situation is very difficult. Recently, however, scientists off the California coast have spent countless hours observing the white shark and are now discovering possible motivations for attacks on humans. Dr. Peter Klimley, organizer of the symposium, has been studying the white shark for nine years at southeast Farallon Island, 30 nautical miles west of San Francisco. White sharks are more, more common in Northern California because it's a temperate environment. There are large populations of seals and sea lions here, which are their major prey. By observing the white's natural feeding behavior, Dr. Klimley is able to draw conclusions based on the way a shark stalks its normal prey, the seal. Lacking a seal's speed and agility, the great white must rely on the element of surprise. It stalks this baby seal from below and behind. The white's stealth capabilities are enhanced by the evolutionary development of a dark back, making it almost invisible from the surface. White shark, in a sense, is misnamed by being called a white shark. Its uh, back is dark and makes it cryptic when seen from above. They may hunt for their prey over dark, rocky backgrounds. So there are two things that you would want to avoid. One is to be diving where there are a lot of seals and sea lions in the fallout area. And secondly, that that is a rocky shoreline because then you know, you're particularly vulnerable uh, to attack. Other areas where there's a sandy bottom, even if it's close to this, these areas may be quite safe because the shark will not remain in an, over a bottom that it can be easily detected by its prey. It's not going to be successfully um, able to ambush its prey there. 
New data revealed at the symposium indicates that great whites, unlike most other shark species, are daytime hunters. And although the whites have an acute sense of smell, they may be primarily a visual predator, cruising just under the surface and looking up for potential meals. This comes as bad news to surfers, who spend most of their time in the water floating on the surface, often over rocky points in areas that seals frequent. At Santa Cruz, California, 32-year-old Eric Larson was floating on his surfboard when he was hit from below by a huge white shark. After receiving major injuries to both arms and his left leg, the surfer was able to fend off the shark and paddle to shore. As he shouted to beachgoers to call 911, Eric began a desperate attempt to stop the bleeding and save his own life. While waiting for paramedics to arrive, Larson instructed beachgoers how to apply pressure to his wounds as he bravely pinched off his own severed arteries. Eric's brother Nick, who had been surfing with him just minutes before, was at his brother's side moments after the attack. I think what happened is that the shark hit him uh, twice, uh, ate his, got his left arm down the mouth of the shark, and Eric had the, the courage to simply bang the shark over the head as hard as he could, trying to get his arm out. After stabilizing, Eric was flown to a nearby hospital for treatment. His excellent physical condition and knowledge of first aid enabled the surfer to survive, despite losing half the blood in his body and receiving hundreds of stitches in surgery. If I were to make a foot gas, I'd say he had about two and a half uh, feet of lacerations to close. Uh, that was, that's at the skin level. At a hospital press conference, a recovering Larson described the attack. And then I felt this incredible clamping feeling like I was just caught in a vice on the left leg. And I didn't quite know what happened, but it spun me off the board into the water. And I think what I did then was I tried to pry his jaws open to get the uh, to get him off me. And I think at that point he took another, he went for another little bite, and I think that's when he got my arms. I guess the big question is, are you gonna go back in surfing again? Yeah, I hope so. You know, the statistical probability of getting hit twice is pretty minimal, so, you know. <laughs> but I've been hit by lightning, too, so, you know. It's... Experts believe that surfers are natural targets for white sharks who investigate the unidentified floating objects by mouthing or tasting them. In most cases, these brief encounters come to a quick conclusion when the shark realizes it has not bitten suitable prey. Ralph Collier with the Shark Research Committee explains. Normally what you have uh, involved with a white shark attack on a human being, or, or let's say even a boat, you'll have an initial strike by the animal. And then he usually will retreat or simply leave the area completely. But generally they will not come in on them a second time. Most of them are single bite incidents. The single bite incident, however, can easily result in such massive trauma to soft human tissues that the victim dies, as Santa Cruz, California diver Steve Gazetta witnessed in 1983. Steve, accompanied by a partner, was out on an early morning dive near an area notorious for great whites. As he entered the water, he noticed two men on an adjoining reef, one diving for abalone, the other floating on a raft. While we were in the water, one of the divers was suddenly on the cliff yelling at us. And uh, he got us out of the water. And I noticed um, that one of the divers was missing. And so then we went back down and followed him to where the other diver was. And he'd been hit by a shark. And then we said, what happened? And he says, he was diving back and forth, just like we'd seen. And he came up from a dive, and the shark had his buddy out of the water four feet and shaking him like mad and then takes him under in this instance the victim omar conger was not gently tasted as in many investigatory attacks but savagely struck and killed as he floated on his air mattress but he'd been hit so badly uh, there was so much blood in the water in fact when we came down along the rocks there were seagulls pounding the water in that spot after the body was up on the beach, I noticed there was no blood in this guy. There was none. His wrists were sliced open, and you could see the bone inside of his leg. And uh, he was laying on the beach for you know, 15 or 20 minutes. There wasn't one drop of blood. His hands were as white as a sheet of paper. I thought they were white gloves. Is that white? 
White shark attacks occur almost annually off California and many other places around the world, including Australia, South Africa, Chile, Mexico, Italy, and Japan. White sharks are seldom seen in warm tropical waters, the domain of an equally dangerous species, the tiger shark. In Hawaii, recent fatal attacks by tigers have spread fear and controversy throughout the islands, sparking man's intervention in a desperate attempt to stop the killing. Until a woman was attacked and killed by a tiger shark just 100 yards from shore in November 1991, there had not been a fatal attack in Hawaii in 33 years. But within a 14-month period, four attacks would follow, creating a climate of fear among local beachgoers, a raging controversy among state officials, and a nervous tourist industry. The majority of victims have been surfers, including two boogie boarders who were attacked and killed by large tiger sharks. Other surfers have been bumped off their boards, and many have been chased from the water as tiger shark sightings have suddenly, inexplicably skyrocketed. Rick Gruzinski has surfed the perfectly formed waves on Oahu's North Shore for 10 years. On October 22, 1992, Gruzinski paddled out alone at Lanakai and positioned himself to catch the next set of waves. Rick recalls the next few seconds as a huge dark shadow rose up from the depths, knocking him off his board. I was laying this way, and shark came up from underneath it and flipped it this way and latched on automatically. So I was in the water like this with the, with the shark right on here and it was a, literally a tug of war until, until the piece broke away. Last thing I remember seeing, like I said, was the piece in the shark's mouth. Uh, as you can see here, there's some teeth marks and the board kind of speaks for itself in a, a situation like that. All I could think about was holding on to the board, and, and now it's like I, d I don't ever want to let the board go. <laughs> With a pizza-sized chunk of surfboard in his mouth, the shark sank out of sight, allowing a shaken but unhurt Rick to paddle to the safety of shore. His well-publicized attack was the third in a year, but even more were soon to follow. In every case, including the three fatalities since November 1991, the offending shark was identified as the notorious tiger, a successful and wide-ranging predator, often scavenging or preying on whatever is available, including stingrays, sea turtles, and occasionally humans. Unlike other species of shark, the tiger is a prolific breeder, easily becoming abundant in near-shore waters. Females give birth to as many as 60 fully developed pups per litter, who, if they escape the jaws of their cannibalistic mother, immediately begin to hunt. As the pups mature, their namesake stripes will fade, and they will grow rapidly, attaining a maximum size of nearly 20 feet. There are a number of theories as to why we've got this rash of attacks in the last year, including two fatalities. Um, my personal feeling is that we haven't had an active fishing program for nearshore sharks in the Hawaiian Islands since the mid-70s. Uh, uh, from the literature, we know that tiger sharks will mature at somewhere between 10 and 12 years of age, so they, the population has certainly had uh, uh, enough time to build up to its maximum levels in our nearshore waters. The state of Hawaii, convinced the tiger shark population had grown to unacceptable levels, established a shark task force to combat the problem. The task force immediately began fishing for tigers after the attack on Rick Rosinski. Starting at night, 12 hooks were baited and dropped into 35 to 40 feet of water directly off the beach where the attack occurred. We're trying to basically weed out the, the animals that are responsible for the attacks, although we realize this is a very difficult thing to do. But because many of us feel that the tiger shark does have a home range, we feel that by immediately going out and making a set after an attack or in an area where, where large tigers or two or three large tigers are seen on a consistent basis, that we can remove those animals. 
the hunt is a success. By morning, three large tigers are caught, creating a circus-like sideshow for media and locals. The heads of harmless gray sharks were all that remained on several hooks, their bodies consumed by the hungry tigers. As victim Rick Grzynski looks on, task force members search for the missing and apparently eaten chunk of surfboard that will positively identify the attacking shark. No, that's stomach. Is, is it? Is it stomach? It does look, because this looks like it comes from all over. You but know, the lost clue to the mystery is not found in the shark's stomachs, but by a local fisherman, leaving the guilt or innocence of these sharks a matter of speculation. Uh, a fisherman found the other piece Later, in that, later that afternoon, he found it about six miles away towards Kaina Point. The piece was intact perfectly as I remember it in the shark's mouth. Looks like it didn't chew it up or do much else with it except maybe spit it out. Although the hunt was popular with some surfers and locals, it left the Hawaiian community divided. Some objected to the hunts on cultural and religious grounds, citing the belief that the shark was often worshipped as a god by previous generations of islanders. Hawaiian activist Charlie Maxwell, invited to represent native interests on the shark task force, quit in protest. Throughout the history of Hawaiians, the shark has been one of the personal gods of different families throughout the islands. My great-grandmother, who grew up in Honolulu, where the attack was two years ago, my father used to see her going out uh, to feed the shark uh, with her breast to suckle the baby sharks. And later on, as it grew older, uh, she kept feeding it. And she told uh, my father that uh, this animal was, uh, was our Aumakua. Anytime there was a shark attack, they would, would go out and try to eliminate the shark that was causing the problem, but not uh, blatantly kill uh, as many sharks as they can like they're doing now. And that's one of the reasons why I resigned from the shark task force. I think the state of Hawaii is going to have to re-evaluate re the shark task force. And uh, because I don't think the people of Hawaii, the Hawaiian people, and even non-Hawaiians, are going to stand for it. But many native Hawaiians have endorsed the shark fishing, which continues with the blessings of kapunas, or elders, who hold a dockside prayer before each hunt. Sharks, like people, come in two kinds. You have good ones and bad ones. If they are your family gardens and your aumakuas, then they are there to protect you. If they are not, then they can be harmful to you. And if they are harmful to you, then you get rid of that enemy. Just two weeks after the Rick Gruzinski attack, 18-year-old boogie boarder Aaron Romento was attacked while he surfed with friends at Kia'ao Beach Park. Head lifeguard Brian Kiolana was at the scene. We got the call over the, you know, the um, radio through 911 saying that we had a shark attack and it was all surprised. So I launched my rescue unit, the jet ski guys, and they responded by water. I went by the um, emergency vehicle. I went by land. I called on the radio to the closest um, beach, which is um, this beach here, Macau Beach, and informed the lifeguards to respond with the oxygen and um, EMS kit. And Aaron fought off the attacking shark and made his way to the beach, but the bite to his leg was massive, and the young Hawaiian perished as his blood spilled onto the sand. He would be the fourth victim in a year. Despite the ongoing controversy, the Shark Task Force, led by Department of Land and Natural Resource Director Bill Patey, went immediately back to work. Yeah. It was a very strong group, as evidenced by one individual uh, who was on a task force committee and quit, uh, who feels very strongly that we're going too far and not uh, controlling the shark hunting. We feel this is, quote, an amakua, a spiritual uh, god that uh, should be revered and it's the only time that they justify shark hunting is when there's been an attack. And yet there are other Hawaiians who have just as much lineage, if you will, or background of culture, or understanding of the thing, they say, that's baloney. The Hawaiians never had uh, tiger sharks as amakua. As a matter of fact, they, they used to go out and hunt sharks in their day. So you get it both ways. 
Like the native Hawaiians, the scientific community is divided over the shark hunting. Chris Lowe, a researcher at the University of Hawaii on Coconut Island, believes the current fishing program may be leaving Hawaiians with a false sense of security. There's very little data to suggest whether shark control is an effective means of reducing the probability of shark attack. Chris is part of a team of scientists and researchers embarking on a study which may eventually provide an answer to Hawaii's ongoing shark attack problems. Using a state-of-the-art sonic tracking device, they hope to monitor tiger shark movements around the islands. The first step will be tagging the sharks with a tiny transmitter. In looking at shark attacks on humans in Hawaii, is we just don't know enough about the biology, the behavior of the animals. So by using this sort of uh, technology, we can monitor the animals over uh, short and medium term time periods and look at their distribution um, along the Hawaiian Islands and along the coastlines. The results of the study could enable scientists to actually predict where an aggressive shark might strike next and provide clear-cut support to the theory that tigers prefer a home range, staking out a particular beach where prey is plentiful. In the meantime, the shark task force can only guess where a tiger shark might strike next and if their fishing program will actually prevent attacks. Good evening, a surfboard and a big bite, and a Kaneohe man who is breathing easier at this hour. Coming up, we'll tell you about Oahu's latest shark attack. As it is continued a case of shark attacks vu. became Hawaii's top story just before Christmas 1992, shockwaves reverberated throughout the surfing community. Well, it definitely makes you look around a lot more, and you, you don't really feel that comfortable out surfing, especially in this area, because there's been one guy died over here, or they never found him. And then Rick got bit here, and then uh, over there at Chun's, we had that guy get his board eaten. So yeah, it's, it's pretty heavy out there sometimes. The fallout from the fifth and latest attack has inspired some Hawaiians to take matters into their own hands. Perry Dane, a North Shore resident and former world-class professional surfer, has embarked on his own eradication program. There's no uh, one particular group that will go out and kill sharks. Fishermen let sharks go. When they when they catch them, as soon as they see it, they cut the lines. Nobody kills okay, sharks. And they no, need no, to be no. reduced, the gill, the gill. especially the gill. tigers. <laughs> That's right. Bring it up. Wait, hold on, hold on. Make it the nose Dolphins, over. they eat okay. turtles. Point the gas. And those are all things that I like. Those are protected by federal yeah. law, and uh, you know what? nobody does anything about the tigers. The so Steve, the nobody's going to do it. I'm going to do it. Setting baited hooks night after night, Dane's persistence pays off. One week after the latest attack, he pulls in two huge tigers, the larger one measuring 15 feet in length, with a set of jaws that Dane now displays with pride. It took a while just to bring this guy in. Uh, my boat's only 20 foot, and the shark was almost as big as my boat, so you can imagine two of them trying to bring them back. Sharks, in general, don't bother me. I swim with sharks all the time, Gra uh, grays, whites, Galapagos, hammerheads. It's the tigers, those are the ones. To have people come up to me and say, you know, save the shark, it's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous, in my opinion, especially tigers. Anybody who says that is not playing with a full deck. Perhaps as much as the hurricanes and volcanic eruptions that rock the islands, the recent shark attacks have once again reminded Hawaiians of the respect deserved by nature. And the ocean, although a provider of food and a playground for humans, is still the domain of the shark. Early mariners whose ships were lost at sea were among the first victims of shark attack, their chilling tales reproduced by artists on wood carvings and canvas. In the summer of 1916, the most celebrated shark attacks in U.S. history took place along the New Jersey coast. Thousands of bathers who flocked to seaside resorts were chased from the water by marauding sharks that attacked five people, killing four during one 12-day period. Shark attack was also a problem in World War II. Without an effective shark repellent, downed airmen and shipwrecked sailors became victims by the hundred. Ex 
experts say the normally docile blue shark is a frequent visitor at maritime disasters, attracted from miles away by the scent of blood in the water. As the post-war baby boomers became shark attack victims in ever-increasing numbers, the need to investigate attacks became apparent. As a result, the shark attack file was established to document all attacks on man. Originally supported by the Navy, the file is currently housed at the University of Florida under the direction of George Burgess. The file itself uh, is a compendium of all known shark attacks worldwide and, and we endeavor, endeavor to, to investigate as many of those as we can. Using a computerized database, shark experts can access information on each attack, including the species of shark responsible and the ocean conditions, clues that are helping the experts worldwide to determine when and where sharks will attack. In Florida, we have one death perhaps every two years, statistically less than one death per year in Florida as a result of shark attack. Uh, the other uh, 10 to 14 attacks then are usually involving the hit and run type in which the victim receives a, either a bite or a laceration uh, and then that's it. Florida's warm tropical climate is home to many species of aggressive sharks including the lemon, tiger and various reef sharks that patrol near shore waters in search of prey. Usually they will avoid man but they have been known to attack. 38-year-old Miami lawyer Bruce Cease was airlifted to a Florida hospital after being attacked by a four-foot shark. Cease was spearfishing with a group of friends when the shark he had been observing suddenly became aggressive. It was very quick. If you can imagine, he was about three feet away, and he turns quickly, and I just put my hands up, and he ended up getting my, uh, uh, my forearm and thrashed for, I guess, five to ten seconds before he let it go. Surfers in Florida face the greatest risk of shark attack. Despite warnings from water safety officials, surfers often invite an encounter by boldly remaining in the water, even when sharks have been sighted. Joe Bosky, a 15-year-old surfer from Jacksonville Beach, received serious wounds to his hand and arm from a shark he never saw. Based on the bite marks, experts estimate the shark was between four and six feet. I was scared pretty much because I didn't know what it was and it happened real quick. It felt like I've been shocked before and it felt like I grabbed a hold of like two live wires and just like ripped into me and it's real fast. And... Shark experts believe the attack on Joe and most other Florida surfers are cases of mistaken identity. In the turbid water of the surf zone, a shark chasing a fish may mistake a dangling foot or hand for his intended meal. I have a theory that some of the shark attacks in our area are, uh, are initiated by the fact that, that most people have uh, white soles of their feet. If you go out and, and are in the sun a lot, you, you get brown all over, except the soles of your feet. Take a look at the bottoms of your feet, particularly if you've been in the water and look at the pruny white feet you have. Uh, put those in, in the water, contrast to your, your dark skin, and you see a, a real contrast. And I suspect that that kind of thing is, is very attractive to sharks. The odds of being attacked or even seeing a shark off Florida beaches are very low, despite the fact sharks often move in very close to shore, chasing schools of fish. I think if people knew that they were in the water and there were sharks in the water around them, they would probably panic. But what, in fact, this actually is demonstrating to the general public and to science at the same time is that if those sharks really wanted to eat people, wouldn't they race in and bite them and eat them? I've seen a number of pieces of film from Florida where we have bathers in the water and they cannot see because of the glare, the reflection, or for whatever reason. But surrounding them are 50 sharks. If those sharks wanted to eat human beings, every one of them would have been taken. South Africa is a nation with a history of tragic shark attacks extending back to the turn of the century. Many of the attacks have occurred along the popular resorts of Natal, fronting the Indian Ocean on the east coast of Africa. White, tiger, and bull sharks frequent these waters and have been primarily responsible for the more than 140 attacks on South African bathers since the 1940s. Because of the frequency of attack here, the Surf Life Saving Association of South Africa features a shark attack drill as one of their requirements for a surf proficiency award. Lifeguards must learn how to apply tourniquets and elevate limbs to prevent victims from bleeding to death. 
and how to stabilize the victim to avoid shock. One and two and three. In an effort to combat the shark attack problems that had plagued them for decades, South Africans created the Natal Anti-Sharks Board. The Sharks Board was actually constituted um, in 1964. And in fact, this was as a direct result of the spate of shark attacks that occurred off the Natal coastline in the late 50s and early 60s. And it was as a result of the effects that um, the shark attacks had on the local tourist industry that the public went to the province of Natal and asked them to create an organization to combat the threat as was perceived to be in those days. The scientists and researchers on the board investigate all attacks in South African waters by examining tooth fragments and the bite radius on surfboards involved with shark attacks. They are able to determine the size and species of the shark responsible. Most of our research is aimed at trying to understand the biology of the shark species that we are dealing with, how they, how they tick. And Given that background, possibly we'll be able to improve our understanding of why sharks from time to time should bite people. The board's primary function, however, is keeping bather and shark from meeting, and it does so by laying and maintaining an elaborate netting system along South African beaches. Currently, 420 nets guard the Natal coast, and since their introduction, shark attack numbers have dropped dramatically. But due to large surf and other ocean conditions, not all beaches can be netted, and many attacks still occur on these unprotected beaches. Longtime local surfer Baron Sander remembers a time of danger before the nets when bathers and pioneering surfers entered the water at their own risk. The last known shock attack in Durban was a friend of mine, Clive Domain, in 1949. Body surfing at South Beach with four other guys. Small surf, nothing wild, and he was right in the middle of the, the other guys when he was taken by a great white. And um, it took him twice. First time he came up, he just shouted, shark, shark. One of my friends looked around and there it came. It went straight past him, dorsal about three feet high, took Clive, that was the end of him. All they found of him was a one and a half inches of liver or lung, I can't remember. And he was never seen again. And under description of what these guys gave, um, they estimated the shark was uh, 12 to 15 feet and weighed a minimum of one and a half thousand pounds. The nets, rather than acting as a barrier between bather and shark, actually functioned like giant gill nets, catching and killing sharks by the hundred. I personally think nets work because in the first place, the uh, tax haven't been plentiful. The shark population has decreased, and um, they stay away. The nets are deadly to sharks who must swim constantly in order to breathe. When caught in the nets, they slowly suffocate. The few sharks that are caught alive in the nets are tagged and released. Dead specimens are brought back to the shark board's lab for research and study. The nets on average kill 45 tiger, 41 great white, and 61 bull sharks per year. But in addition to these dangerous species, many harmless animals also fall victim. Dolphins, sea turtles, and even whales have died in the nets, prompting outrage from environmentalists. Many are convinced the nets, conceived long before a worldwide movement toward ecology, may be upsetting the ocean's delicate balance. International shark expert Dr. Len Campagno vehemently opposes the nets. As for the nets themselves, uh, I think they, uh, they're the result of a, of a climate of fear of a different era. You have to read the newspapers of two decades ago uh, to uh, appreciate the, the kinds of fear that were being generated by a shark attack that were reverberating in the media. You sort of get the impression that uh, of a total war atmosphere, that the people are girding themselves for an onslaught by uh, killer sharks, almost as if the sharks were gangs of hell's angels and they'd ride on the beaches with their motorcycles, uh, grabbing people and dragging them into the water. The fear of shark attack has led to massive slaughter and a vast reduction of the great white shark in South African waters. This great white is the shark species responsible for most of the attacks in South African waters.
Hearty anglers fished for and caught hundreds of whites from beaches at Durban and Cape Town in the 50s and 60s. Today, South Africa has become the first country to enact legislation to protect the white shark from sport anglers. But without protection from the nets, this necessary predator may still face the possibility of extinction in South African waters. Efforts to remove the nets have been stalled as scientists have yet to create an effective shark repellent. Electronic repellent devices have been tested, but with only limited success. We do not have an, an alternative to nets right now, and who knows, we might never have the alternative. But yes, the Shark Sport is aware of environmental issues, and we're certainly looking at all the possibilities available to us. Of the 368 species of shark, only four are considered dangerous to man, and the vast majority, like this tiny swell shark, are completely harmless. Still, the words shark and shark attack inspire fear and loathing in the general public, an attitude Mark Marx is determined to change. A senior at California State University at Humboldt, Mark feels the shark's image problem is primarily due to sensational media coverage of attacks and a Hollywood Jaws stereotype that just won't go away. What's really sort of unfortunate for sharks overall is that when, when the public thinks of a shark, they think of um, the white shark, this large media hyped animal, the supposedly man-eater and frenzied killer. And the majority of sharks are really very inoffensive and fairly small. In his quest to vindicate the shark, Marx has launched a grassroots organization, the Shark Protection and Preservation Association, designed to educate and thereby change public perception of sharks and to lobby for legislation to protect sharks from man. But finding sympathy for the predators has been difficult, and so far the organization has received mixed reviews. Yeah, I just wanted to call and express my view or my feelings on shark protecting. My little brother was eaten by a shark, and uh, I believe in saving a whale, but not them damn bastards. I really hate people like you, it's just stupid. The devil's creatures, um, a little difficult thing to counter. Um, sort of shows the uh, irrationality about these animals. Through the talks he gives and positive publicity he generates, Marx is hopeful the white shark will receive some of the same public sympathy that whales and dolphins have received. Uh, I think education is the key here. You need to inform people uh, about the misconceptions and stereotypes that have been traditionally portrayed in media, literature, and so forth. These kinds of images, these Jaws monster-like images, um, perpetrate this a post-Jaws notoriety that has done so much harm over the years to these animals as a species. Um, it's encouraged the killing of them, which is uh, a very foolish act because it, it has detrimental effects to the marine ecosystem. No one knows more about the killing of the great white than Australia's Vic Hislop. Scoffing at the concerns of conservationists, Hislop enjoys a profitable career as a great white hunter, and by his own admission has killed hundreds of whites in his effort to balance the seas. We're thinning out everything except the large dangerous sharks because none of the fishing that's done by man catches the large sharks. Now already we've noticed that all over the world there's been shark attacks in the last few years um, where they've never had attacks before. We're going to see an alarming increase in this because of the heavy fishing. The big sharks are coming closer and closer to shore and um, we're thinning out their fish and we're going to be puttering around in the water and um, it's going to get a lot worse. Profiting on the fear and hysteria generated by shark attack, Vic operates his own roadside shark show in North Queensland, Australia. While scientists and experts struggle to save the white shark, Vic carries out his one-man assault on the huge predator, hunting it without restriction in his home waters. Dr. Leonard Campagno spearheaded the drive to protect the white shark in South Africa. 
The white shark is a difficult animal because of its vulnerability. It lives in uh, all the wrong places, that is, closely adjacent to large, uh, uh, rather highly developed populations of human beings. It's easily accessible via modern technology and the like. It's not that difficult to kill off white sharks, despite all the machismo hero business that's made about it. It isn't a big thing to go out with uh, barrels and chains and the like and catch uh, these large sharks. But the controversial Hislop considers his unique work very necessary. It's a big thing to go out catching huge great white sharks and huge tiger sharks. And very few people in the world will ever do it or even consider it. There's a movement now to protect great white sharks. You know, it's utterly ridiculous to protect the end of the food chain and wipe out all his food, which is what we're doing. You just can't do that. It's common sense, you know. Mark Marks disagrees, but even with a new global shift towards conservation, enacting laws to protect the white is very difficult. The problem is proving the white shark is threatened, something shark experts have been unable to do. Since the shark is seldom seen and little is known about its reproductive habits, estimating numbers of whites in existence may never be possible. Frequently people say, you know, these white sharks and are on the increase. Well, in fact, I don't believe that to be true. I think what you have is that more people are, are utilizing the area, and thus now they're being sighted. My personal feeling is that the white shark is in a very precarious position. I have no problem saying that I believe it's a threatened animal. And contrary to what most people believe, it's not directly related to commercial fishery, but to a small, um, highly efficient group of sport anglers that have the money and the capabilities of pulling off these animals. In my opinion, they really are criminals because they're doing an injustice to everyone by injuring the sea's uh, livelihood. Trinidad Bay is a rocky inlet on the Northern California coast near the Oregon border. Its temperate waters, large seal population, and mostly rocky shoreline make it an ideal habitat for white sharks who occasionally interact with local surfers and kayakers. Despite two attacks here in 1991, Mark Marks has worked to downplay the incidents. The first attack took place roughly six feet off of these rocks, uh, and it uh, entailed a, a surfer being bumped off his board, and bump is a key word here. This wasn't some kind of a frenzied attack or anything. This was a shark investigating. Almost the, gently, the, the white shark tasted Rodney Swan, leaving minor puncture wounds to his leg and barely more than scratches on his board. The shark then disappeared. From the radius of the bite mark on the surfboard and Rodney's description, Marks estimates the shark to be well over 15 feet in length. Considering the shark's size, it could have easily made a meal of Swan, but instead only tasted him, and finding the combination of fiberglass surfboard and neoprene wetsuit unpalatable, spit him out. The popular explanation of this type of incident has been the shark mistook the surfer for its normal prey, the seal, a theory currently under scrutiny. There have been cases and attacks of mistaken identity, but that's quite different from investigatory uh, behavior, which seems to constitute the majority of human encounters, especially when we're talking about surfers. Obviously, if a white shark believed that a surfer were its prey source, it wouldn't come in and just go lethargically and take a bite because its animal would escape. It would come in very hard and immobilize its prey and feed. This type of behavior leads scientists who believe that the white shark is perhaps capable of making cognitive decisions as it searches out its prey. After his attack, Rodney returned to surf Trinidad Bay. Although the emotional scars received in his harrowing encounter were perhaps deeper than his physical ones, Rodney overcame his fear through a new understanding of the ocean and a new respect for its most notorious predator. There's no reason to go out and have people get up, take out their angers and frustrations on these animals. They're a real easy target. I mean, they, granted, they are the most gruesome looking animals when they're in their feeding mode that I've ever seen, ever seen. Eyes rolled back, teeth distended, jaws bloody. It was an incredible sight. But um, I believe that they have a right among all other animals to be as they are and to live. And I don't think that uh, 
going out and killing them, and sticking your head in the jaws when it's dead, and having your brother Sam take a picture of it is very cool. Despite all our technological advances in the 20th century, man's only recourse against shark attack remains the same as it has always been, to stay out of the water. Is the threat of shark attack serious? Experts say no, but even the most remote chance of being bitten or perhaps eaten alive is enough to cause some to strike out in fear and kill these magnificent predators. Man fears what he does not understand, and most certainly the shark remains one of the most misunderstood creatures on Earth.